Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Blue, and I'm a police officer with 10 years of experience. Here we'll be talking about all things crime, from old cases to current events, to the obscure and well-known alike. If you like that kind of thing, check out my previous videos and subscribe to stay up to date on new videos, which I post here weekly. Today, we're going to be talking about Richard Chase, also known as the Vampire of Sacramento. This case is horrific and has victims of all ages, including newborns, so be warned. Today, we'll be going over a background of Chase, to include his childhood and life leading up to the crimes. We'll also detail his crimes in order as best we can, and try to identify any areas where he should have or could have been caught sooner, seeing where lives could have been saved. I'd just like to say as a disclaimer, these videos include my own personal views based on my own training and experiences in the field, and are not views of any department or organization. With that being said, let's start as we always do, with a brief background of our subject. Richard Trenton Chase was born on May 23, 1950, to father Richard Chase Sr. and mother Beatrice Chase in Santa Clara, California. Based on what we know from his parents and therapists early on, Richard was a very troubled child. He was allegedly shown to exhibit three very troubling behaviors, which are a part of something called the McDonald Triad. The three signs are cruelty to animals, obsession with setting fires, and bedwetting that persist past the age of five years old. This theory proposes that when any two of these are present in a child, it is a strong predictor of violent tendencies, especially as it relates to later serial killings. Now this is not my area of expertise, and other later studies are said to show that these signs also show up in children who are abused, neglected, or traumatized in other ways at a young age. Others argue that this is actually the reason these children are more likely to display these violent tendencies, not that the children are just naturally born like this. In either event, Richard Chase had them, and they would be made worse in a chaotic home environment. According to Chase's younger sister, she recalled him being picked up and thrown into walls by Richard Chase Sr. whenever he would get drunk, and he was often verbally abused. By the age of 13, Chase continued to display alarming behaviors and signs of mental illness. Apparently, he began to believe that he was part of the James Younger Gang, the notorious outlaw group of murderers and robbers from the late 1800s. He even hung up a poster of the gang with his own face pasted onto one of the characters on his bedroom wall. Chase would develop odd habits, like burning pans in the middle of the night and making messes in the kitchen and not acknowledging it or cleaning it up, or turning up the heat in the house when he was alone and just lying naked on the couch all night. He also remained fascinated with lighting matches and starting small fires, and his bedwetting and animal torture would continue. While in high school and college, Chase used a reportedly large amount of drugs, ranging from marijuana to psychedelics. Interestingly enough, despite what we hear about the harmless nature of marijuana, there is new evidence showing it can cause psychosis and schizophrenia in those who are already considered at risk or predisposed to getting it, which Richard Chase seems to have been. Chase's first arrest would be during this time of his youth, a minor charge of marijuana possession. In 1971, Chase had moved into an apartment with friends, but his odd behavior, which included boarding up the doors of his bedroom and closet, heavy drug use, and walking around the home naked for long periods of time, caused his roommates to request that he leave. When Chase refused to leave, his friends moved out, and he was eventually forced back into his parents' home anyway. While Chase was a young man, he dated numerous women, but was reported to experience impotency, something that frustrated him to no end. This could have been caused by numerous factors, such as the drug use, mental illness or stress, or the previous traumas, but Chase seemingly did not seek help for this. Chase would begin to mentally deteriorate during this time. He made numerous strange and downright impossible claims, such as believing that he did not have enough blood in his body, causing him to eat the blood of animals he killed in order to replenish his blood supply. He also believed that his heart was shrinking, and that someone had stolen his pulmonary artery, causing his heart to stop beating. Another one of these strange beliefs was that the bones in his head were shifting around on their own, and that he believed this so deeply that he shaved his head in order to try and see them moving. If anyone is familiar with schizophrenia, then you know how well-founded, in their own minds, these beliefs can be. There is no reasoning or talking someone out of a belief like this when they are in this state. As an officer, I've run into numerous people on a regular basis who have to be Baker Acted, which in Florida is an involuntary examination due to a suspected mental health condition. I can think just off the top of my head of several times where a person believed wholeheartedly that any and all medication was poison and that they outright refused to take it, which was a vicious cycle that just caused them to go untreated for long periods of time. Now the point of a Baker Act is to ensure that those who cannot or will not help themselves in regards to their mental illness will be forced to get help for their own good and the good of those around them. And yet, I see these people spend a day or two in the hospital and get released, in the same or sometimes even worse condition than they went in. Our mental health care in the United States is a revolving door and barely qualifies as a band-aid solution. And imagine for a moment if you're the person afflicted by this. You believe that you're being poisoned by the medicine everyone around you is forcing you to take. The police show up and take you to a hospital by force, where you're forced again to take medicine for up to three days that you again wholeheartedly believe is poison. Then you're released and told to keep taking this medication. How is that treatment plan going to actually help anyone? But let's get back to the topic at hand. 
Richard would continue to display dangerous and reckless behavior, some of it criminal. Let's take a look at some notable examples and see what could have or should have been done about it. Here we can get a better look at times those closest to Chase failed to do enough, or sometimes anything, to get him the help he needed. At a party, Chase fondled a girl and the police were called. As he was being escorted out, a gun fell from his belt and he was sent to jail and bailed out by his father. This charge would later be dropped. Throughout 1973, Chase continued to explain of non-existent ailments, like head injuries and stomach aches, and maintained his claims of a missing pulmonary artery, a shrinking heart, and made-up blood flow problems. A neurologist later stated that Chase was suffering from a psychiatric disturbance of major proportions, and he was admitted to the psychiatric ward of a local hospital. His mother, however, would remove him from the facility, presumably against doctor's orders. In an argument with his mother, Chase would hit her hard enough to knock her to the floor. This, of course, went unreported to the police. Chase's father occasionally came to visit him at his apartment. During one of these visits, he discovered Chase very ill, suffering from blood poisoning. It was later revealed that this was caused by Chase injecting rabbit's blood into his veins. This instance would be enough to put him yet again into a mental institution for a short period. While at the facility, Chase would earn himself the nickname Dracula because of his blood fixation. While there, he broke the necks of two birds he caught through the institution windows and would drink their blood. He also extracted blood from therapy dogs with syringes that he would take from the staff. While here, Chase finally receives a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. On one occasion in 1977, Chase's mother Beatrice was greeted at her front door by her son, who was offering her a dead cat. When she refused it, he proceeded to rip the animal apart and smear its blood on himself. His mother just went back inside the house and again, did not report this incident to anyone. Later in the year, Beatrice helped her son plan and finance an extended trip out of state. In August of the same year, Bureau of Indian Affairs officers in Nevada came upon Chase's car stuck in the sand on reservation lands. Inside, they found a bucket of cow's blood, a cow liver, and two guns. Chase was located nearby, totally naked and screaming, covered in cow's blood. He claimed the blood was leaking out of his own body. He was arrested, but eventually released, with the U.S. Attorney's Office opting not to prosecute. One of the issues, as I see it, is that people like Chase just fell through the cracks during this time in America. It was rare for the severely mentally ill to get proper, actually effective treatment, and even rarer to just be put in an asylum for the rest of their lives. Additionally, he continued to have contact with law enforcement and get arrested, but in the above case, it was dismissed. This is a major mischance. The courts could have easily made it so in lieu of going to jail, Chase could have been forced to go into a long-term treatment facility, potentially fixing his mental illness, or at least giving us a shot at it. That being said, some claim that Chase's mental illness was brought on by his heavy drug use. In either case, something should have been done here, and yet we would continue to release him back into the public. After his release, Chase continued to purchase and capture animals for use in his so-called blood rituals. He also bought a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol, a weapon he would later shoot into a woman's house. This just shows a lapse in our gun laws at the time, which would allow somebody like Chase, who was severely mentally ill, to even purchase a firearm. All the failings of society at the time, the court system, and Chase's own mother would finally culminate in the birth of the Vampire of Sacramento. December 29th, 1977. 51-year-old Ambrose Griffin has just returned home from a shopping trip with his family and is bringing groceries inside. His wife would later report that she heard him yelling at something or someone, and as he turned around while carrying groceries, he just dropped to the ground. At the same time, his wife thought it was a heart attack, but would later report hearing two loud pops. In the emergency room, it was discovered that Ambrose had been shot twice with a 22 caliber round. At the time, police had no way to find the perpetrator of this random act of violence. But good detective work would eventually connect Ambrose's shooting to another recent shooting. A woman had reported that her house had been shot by a stranger, and a 22 caliber round was recovered from the home, matching the rounds that had taken Ambrose's life. But police were a long way off of capturing the killer, who was only just beginning his spree. In the next two weeks, Chase would have two failed attempts at violence, but showed his deranged state of mind nonetheless. In one instance, Chase attempted to enter a woman's home, but found all the doors and windows locked. Incredibly enough, Chase considered this a sign that he was not welcome and left. This is eerily similar to what Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, would say during his spree killings in 1984. In one instance, Chase entered a home but was caught and chased away by the returning homeowners. Checking their home afterwards, they became aware that Chase had urinated and defecated on their infant's bed and clothing. As vile as this was, things were about to get much worse. These next crimes are horrific and include young children and the unborn, so fair warning of what's ahead. Going back to Chase's earlier statements, remember that he says he only went into unlocked homes. January 23rd, 1978. 22-year-old Teresa Wallen is home alone, three months pregnant, waiting for her husband to come home. Instead, Richard Chase would walk into her unlocked front door. 
Chase encounters her as she's taking the garbage out, and points his 22 caliber handgun at her. As Teresa raises her arm to defend herself, she is shot twice, one in the arm and once in the head, killing her. Teresa collapses, as Chase kneels over her and shoots her once more in the temple. Chase drags her body through the home into the bedroom, before retrieving a knife and an empty yogurt bottle from the kitchen. At 6 p.m. that night, Teresa's husband David arrives home, oddly enough finding the German shepherd that the couple had unharmed and waiting for him at the front door. Due to the darkness of the night and the lights being off inside the home, David mistakes the blood on the floor for an unknown stain, and enters the bedroom to ask Teresa about it. David walks in on one of the most horrific scenes anyone could imagine. Teresa is lying on her back on the floor, with her sweater pulled up, exposing her breasts, and her pants and underwear have been pulled down around her ankles. Her body appeared to have been mangled as if by an animal. Teresa's entire stomach had been sliced open, with her internal organs and intestines pulled out and lying on the floor, and her chest covered in large stab wounds. Autopsy would later confirm that her kidneys had been cut out before being placed back inside of her body. Blood was all over the bathroom, with rings of blood on the floor around her body. It would later be discovered that the empty yogurt carton we mentioned earlier was used to contain her blood, making it easier to drink. But even after all this, after mutilating her body to this extent, Chase was not done humiliating his victim. An autopsy would later reveal that after Chase had sexually battered her body, he went to the backyard and took some dog feces, shoving a large volume of it down her throat before fleeing the area. Imagine how absolutely horrific that scene must have been for the husband to find. I can only hope that he was able to find some sort of peace in life in the years that followed. Two days later, police get a report of a mutilated dog found on the road, not far from where the Wallens live. A man fitting Chase's description had bought two puppies from nearby family, and one of those dogs was the one that was found. It appears Chase continued his early habits of animal cruelty, in addition to his other grisly crimes. Chase's spree was coming to a close, but not before several more innocent people would suffer at his hands. On January 27, 1978, Chase would enter the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Miroff, located just one mile from the Wallen residence. Evelyn was babysitting her 20-month-old nephew, David. At the home was Evelyn's friend, 51-year-old Dan Meredith, who had come over to keep her company. Part of the day's plans were for Evelyn's six-year-old son, Jason, to visit a neighbor's house for a play date. When Jason never showed up, the neighbors sent their daughter to check on him. It was reported that this little girl saw someone moving inside the home, but no one would answer the door, thankfully for the little girl. Throughout the day, the neighbors became worried, and one who knew Evelyn would eventually enter her home, stumbling upon what is surely the worst thing they've ever seen or experienced in this life. The neighbor immediately called the police, who would respond and find Danny lying on the floor of the hallway in a large pool of blood. Danny had been shot in the head and appears to have died instantly. Continuing onward into the crime scene, police discovered Evelyn lying naked on her bed, also appearing to have been shot in the head. Examination of her body revealed that she had her abdomen cut wide open, with all her intestines pulled out, just like his last victim, Teresa. It appeared she had been shot and killed instantly while she was bathing. Then she was dragged to the bed, her body repeatedly sodomized, and violently stabbed multiple times. The killer stabbed her in her anus repeatedly deeply sliced her neck several times, and made a poor attempt at cutting out one of her eyes. On the other side of the bed, officers made another awful discovery. Six-year-old Jason was lying on the floor, having been shot in the head twice. All victims had been shot with a 22 caliber, just like the other victims. While officers were trying to get a handle on this terrible and enormous crime scene, Evelyn's sister would show up, absolutely devastated by the news. But through her grief, she asked a chilling question to officers on scene. Where is my baby? As she informed officers about Evelyn babysitting her young child, officers checked the home again and saw a crib with a small bullet hole in one of the pillows, with a small amount of blood present. As the investigators could only wonder what had happened to him, later on David's fate would be learned. After Chase was done with his other murders, he had taken the baby into the bathroom, where he crushed his head, leaving brain matter in the tub. Around the same time, a neighbor had knocked on the door, causing Chase to flee out of the home with the body of David. He would take him back to his own home, where he decapitated him and removed and ate several of his organs. While we have covered some depraved killers on this channel, few rise to this level of absolute wickedness. It makes me sick to even have to research this and recount these terrible crimes to you all. But fortunately, Chase's time was coming to an end. Inside the Wallen home, Chase had left numerous bloody shoe prints. These same shoe prints were also left behind in Evelyn's home. Officers conducted a neighborhood canvas, an old investigative technique where we walk house to house and talk to everyone in the area asking them if they saw anything out of the ordinary, even if they didn't think it could be important. While doing this, officers discovered a young girl who told them she had seen an out-of-place man in the area of Evelyn's home around 11 a.m. You see, Richard had a very unusual look, something that if you live in most cities today is actually pretty common. But in the 1970s, a man like Richard just stood out. A very thin build, with long stringy hair, a dirty appearance, and a habit of talking to himself out loud. 
he would be memorable to the people of the time, to say the least. Dan Meredith's red station wagon had also been taken, but it was quickly discovered abandoned less than two miles from the murder scene, keys still in the car. The parking lot where the car was abandoned was just 300 feet away from the apartment complex that Chase lived at. The FBI had already been called in to assist the local agencies, due to the number of victims and extreme viciousness of the crimes. FBI agents Rob Ressler and Russ Forpagel would develop a profile of the likely killer, a profile that was surprisingly accurate. The profile of the killer supposed he was a disorganized killer, as opposed to an organized one, with some clues pointing towards the possibility of psychosis. He clearly had not planned these crimes, and he did nothing to hide or destroy the evidence. He left footprints, fingerprints, and DNA, and had probably walked around in daylight with blood on his clothing. In other words, he gave very little thought to the consequences. At the very least, he was assumed to live nearby because of the fact that the murder scenes were fairly close together, and this meant he might not have a car. In fact, he'd taken a car from the most recent crime scene, so he must have walked to that one at the very least. That meant it was likely that he lived in the vicinity of the crimes. It was also likely that he would kill again, and keep on killing until he was caught. Officers had to work fast. The killer was assumed to be a white man in his mid-twenties, thin and undernourished. Evidence of his crimes would likely be found in his residence, and if he had a vehicle, in there as well. He either would have a history of mental illness or drug use, or both, and he would be something of a loner. They thought he was probably employed at some part-time job, or just outright unemployed, given his apparent state of mind, and he could be receiving some disability money. He likely lived alone. After talking to several people, a sketch of the suspect was compiled and spread around the area, in flyers and on the news. And as fate would have it, a chance encounter would bring the killer's name to police. We spoke earlier about the homes that Chase was caught burglarizing, where he had urinated and defecated on a child's bed and clothes. That same day, a woman named Nancy Holden was shopping when she was approached by Chase. As we said before, he had an extremely out of place look, and so Nancy was understandably unnerved. But Chase would ask her a strange question out of the blue. Were you on the motorcycle when Kurt was killed? Nancy was blown away by this question. Nearly a decade earlier, while in high school, she had dated a boy named Kurt who had been killed in a motorcycle accident. This repressed thought brought back the remembrance of this wretched looking man in front of her. When she asked him for his name, he told her Rick Chase. Nancy remembered Chase from high school, but she was shocked at his transformation. He appeared nothing like the handsome, clean cut student she had known so long ago. Nancy got a very good look at him while they talked for several minutes, before she became uncomfortable and went to her car. She was followed by Chase, who demanded she give him a ride, but she locked her doors and fled, something that almost assuredly saved her from a terrible fate. When she saw the police sketch days later, she immediately reported it and gave his name to investigators. Equipped with this incredibly valuable piece of information, investigators discovered that Chase had a 22 caliber handgun registered to him, bought in December of 1977, and with this, they also discovered his address and just how close he was to where the crimes had been committed. A background check showed investigators just how deranged Chase was, detailing everything we spoke about earlier regarding his earlier crimes and trips to the psych ward. Detectives knocked and tried to speak to him, but he refused to leave. So they pulled an old trick, pretending to leave, they set up surveillance on the place. A short time later, Chase exited, wearing the same orange parka he had been seen wearing by the young girl the day of the triple homicide, while carrying a small box. As police approached, Chase began to resist and fight back, but was eventually subdued and taken into custody. The box Chase had contained a bloodstained 22 caliber handgun, and his parka and shoes were also bloodstained. Adding to the growing mound of evidence was Dan Meredith's wallet also found in Chase's pocket. Chase was taken back to the station and interviewed, where he actually spoke with investigators. Chase claimed that all the blood on him was from animals, perhaps relying on his earlier experience that he would not be charged if he was hurting animals for their blood. But Chase refused to admit to his crimes, and at this time, police were still looking for the small child's body, some hoping against hope that he was still alive. Officers went to Chase's apartment and uncovered a scene even bloodier, somehow, than the other crime scenes. Blood coated the walls and parts of the ceiling, and was seemingly everywhere on the floor. Dishes were covered in it, with some glasses half full of old blood. You guys can't imagine the smell of a place like that, so filled with rotting blood, I hope you never have to smell something like it. Inside the refrigerator, they found body parts, with one container holding chunks of what they later found to be human brain tissue. On the table was a newspaper, with local ads circled for dogs for sale. Perhaps most chilling of all these discoveries was a calendar on the table. On the dates of the Wallen and Evelyn murders, Chase had written today, and had also written that on 44 other dates for the same calendar year. Thank God for good citizens stepping up and helping assist good police work, or who knows just how long this maniac spree would have gone on for. After arrest and at trial, Chase would of course plead not guilty by reason of insanity. An insanity plea defense means that Chase admits to all the crimes he was charged with, 
but basically says that because he suffered from such a severe degree of mental illness at the time of the murders, he is not guilty because he did not have the intent to commit the crimes. In order to disprove this and show Chase had intent to commit his crimes, prosecutor Ronald W. Totterman pointed out Chase's obsession with blood, as well as his need and desire for it was what led him to murder. The trial venue had to be changed because of the amount of local publicity surrounding the case. Throughout this trial, over a dozen psychiatrists had analyzed Chase, who all determined that he knew the difference between right and wrong, and just chose to murder people because their blood was therapeutic to him. Also important was the element of sexual violence in these cases, something that had nothing to do with Chase's blood obsession. Chase's defense on the stand, summarized, was that he was sorry, and that he just wanted their blood. Chase claimed that all his problems came from his inability to have sex, which somehow led him to murder in such horrific ways. The jury was tasked with deciding Chase's sanity. After just an hour of deliberation, they decided that he was sane. On May 8th of 1978, the jury returned a verdict of guilty on five counts of first-degree murder after only five hours of deliberation. Chase was now sentenced to die in the gas chambers. FBI agent Robert Ressler met with Chase in prison, who gave him rambling and outrageous theories about why he had committed the murders. Chase claimed to be Jewish and to have been mind-controlled by Nazi UFOs who told him that his blood was turning to powder and that he had to drink blood to replenish it. Prison staff, as well as Ressler, believed that Chase should be moved to a psychiatric hospital, which he was for a short period, but afterwards soon returned to prison. Ressler also became aware that other inmates were disgusted by and frightened of Chase, and often tried to get him to kill himself through various means. On December 26, 1980, just before the three-year mark of Chase's murders, his life would end. While performing his rounds, a prison guard noticed Chase lying on his stomach strangely, face down with his feet hanging off the bed. After calling out to him with no answer, guards would enter and discovered that the vampire of Sacramento was no more. Chase, who had been taking numerous medications for his psychosis, had saved up weeks of his medicine, taking it all at once in order to kill himself. And that brings us to the end of this horrific twisted case, and the end of Richard Chase's sad, psychotic life. Despite the brutality of this case, I hadn't actually heard about it until recently. The worst part about this case is that it does seem preventable, perhaps if he had gotten the help he actually needed. But with a likewise mentally ill mother who enabled him by not adhering to his medications and taking him out of the hospital, she only ensured his illness spiraled out of control until it cost the lives of six innocent people. I hope you guys liked the video, and if so, feel free to like and subscribe. I'll have more coming next Wednesday, so be sure to check that out. If you guys have any other suggestions, then feel free to leave them in the comments. And as always, stay safe and stay tuned.